it gives us great pleasure to welcome you to the third day of the eantra robotics competition finals eyrc 2020 21 eantra teaches practical robotics and engineering skills through its competition themes this year's themes were drawn from the domain of industry 4.0 problems since covid lockdown made it difficult to distribute hardware eantra made covid friendly themes through its use of open source simulation technology in this theme We train participants to solve an industry warehousing problem using a universal robotics UR5 collaborative robotic arm. The programming skills learned are real except for the final run inside a simulator. We outlined the problem along with an objective formula for grading a finished solution. Students were taught all the skills required through project based learning in competition mode over a period of 6 months. Teams uploaded a video of their final run along with an account of their experiences in reaching the goal at the finals the students faced a viva by an iit bombay faculty jury so we have a very interesting jury today there are almost 1880 students who participated as 470 teams in this wargi bots theme out of which the top 7 are going to present what they've done today we now highlight the stages of the competition and detail the skills learned at each stage while designing this theme we looked at various challenges that are currently faced in warehouse automation for this we did some research and found out this article which says fully automated amazon warehouses are at least a decade away We even look at how robots in these warehouses interact with the cloud to fulfill an order. The eantra competition trains participants in complex skills by breaking them down into subtasks that we lead them through systematically. In the wargi bots theme, we simulate a warehouse management system using two UR5 robotic arms that pick and sort incoming packages based on priority whilst updating a dashboard in real time to provide timely notifications. However, there are a number of challenges. first using computer vision to identify packages on the shelf then automatically updating the inventory on google sheets using the rest api then receiving orders from the customer using an mqtt protocol then we pick the packages from the shelf and place them on the conveyor we send an email notification to the customer saying that their order has been dispatched we control the conveyor to transport the package to the second robotic arm for sorting and then we send an email notification to the customer saying that their order has been shipped finally we update the order dispatch sheet via http and use the second ur5 arm to sort the packages based on priority and then we update a custom dashboard to present data in real time on a website it was a good experience in learning new concepts which we have never tried before welcome to the demonstration video of our team bb900 what if you had say 10000 orders how would it all fit into the screen we made the dashboard using a bootstrap so I hope the table can also extend continuously if there are more orders also. I think there won't be any problem for it. Your graph is showing each order separately, right? So there's only so much that can fit in there. Would you have, do you have thoughts about redesigning it in a different way? Presently, we are not sure, but I think it's it's possible. Whenever you have a dashboard, it should be optimized for summary information because you typically use a dashboard to identify things that are going wrong, not show things that are going right. If you had to show the current status. you could have it along with each line of the order you don't need a separate graph for it in the same row or overlaid on that you can see what is the progress everyone has every single row that you have for an each order status if you want you can have a progress the question is if you had to make a different configuration of a different layout how much time will it take you to be able to reconfigure this layout and uh, make it suit another something else that is required this book or this body of work by edward tufte t u f t e called the visual display of quantitative information and how you can have very clever ways of visualizing numerical information what would you consider as optimizing the trajectory of course you have to keep it collision free 
But once you have it collision free, uh, what do you think of as optimal? Is it simply time or is there any other factor you would consider? You have right now just one package coming at a time. So you have the luxury of waiting for it, stopping your conveyor, picking it and putting it in into the bin. When you have uh, many other uh, you know, cells which are feeding the same conveyor line, you have many more packages coming down the line very fast. So what are the factors you would look at to be able to handle higher loads? So you should look around. There are people pick up packages from moving belts themselves, where they will put an encoder on the belt and use that to synchronize along with your. A lot of the robotic arms will come with an input for feeding in the speed of the conveyor belt also. And that will allow you to pick up moving objects. Like this project also help us to get ready for the real world industry. Really give us an experience what uh, industry demands and what is required from us. Suppose you have a low priority order and suddenly you get a rash of high priority orders. So of course the high priority takes priority. But suppose you have this, this constraint of a service level agreement that even a low priority order should not take more than a certain amount of time. There is a fairness issue also involved, right? Yes, you sir. can't continuously being unfair just because it's tagged as low priority does not mean the person should have to wait forever. If you gave that modification, yes. oh, how would you tweak the algorithm? Alternatively, what you could do is just bump up the priority of something that's been waiting too long. So even though it's low priority, mm -hmm. if it's been skipped over many times, a certain number of times, then it moves over to the next level priority. The team is trying to do over here is to create dynamic trajectories and to be able to, you know, modify the waypoints on the move. So most industrial applications do have very static approaches of how things happen. It's very repetitive in the way things happen. Right. The problem statement that you're solving does require uh, the ability to be able to, you know, think and correct on a real-time basis. The ratio of the payload to the weight is, you know, very, very high. So you also have this challenge of like, real-time administering the weight of the product that you're carrying. The bars and the graphs are generally relative. So when you have two, three items and then you're comparing them, then possibly bars and graphs. Help. But the point is, the, the warehouse owner immediately wants to know if there is an urgent order. That's number one. So that you can plan out the thing just in just in case. Second is, I think if there are any um, breakages or any problems or any things which are brewing up to become a problem somewhere, the toll gates or whatever, as we call it in industry, he needs to understand whether there is going to be a potential problem in the future or how the inventory has to be planned in the future, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So when I see your dashboard, what I'm seeing is there is a lot of scrolling happening there. So I see the uh, map first which is a very useful information where the orders are going across the India, across the country. But you yourself have said that is not the highest priority item. Highest priority item for him to see is actually what are the things which are high priority items and how they are performing. They have to flash up and they have to really stand out, you know, amidst the other things. And this third thing which is there is there in the dashboard itself. You have all the list of things which are coming up and they are coming one after another after another. Maybe the immediate order comes up and then the next order comes up, the, this order slides down, something like that happens. But they're all in one color. So if at all there is a high priority order which is slid down, I wouldn't even notice it if there is a stack of so many orders right there. Although it is written <laughs> HP and you know, some, but when I'm looking at a wall of information, there is a color coding there which helps me, you know, pick immediately. I personally feel as the user is concerned, who is going to see and interact with the thing, you should just get into the shoes of the user and see what are the things which he would need and then fine tune your dashboard, which is your interface. I noticed that the speed of the conveyor belt is faster in the simulation, right? As compared to the speed of the joint. Taking this into consideration, can you think of some optimization or you have done some optimization based on that, right? Now you've done the simulation using a UR5 robot from Universal Robots. So how much of your code and how much of your uh, integration was dependent on this robot? And what if we had to change this to another robot? How long would it take you to be able to get the same problem statement working? Have you written all this into a separate uh, lookup where you can just go and make a changes or is it right now hard coded to be able to work with universal robots algorithm and uh, you know programming method? Keep emphasizing to people that they should understand the model view controller framework because that helps you think of how you want to program. 
and how to make it really productive and uh, easily changeable. All the older technologies, you take so much more time to make any changes and introduce bugs whenever you do it. It's a bit more ramp up to get to know it, but once you learn it, it's so much faster when you use uh, any platform that is based on a model view controller kind of framework. When you are out there solving a problem, you can't be limited by the discipline which has trained you. Right? You got to look for a solution that does the work most efficiently, effectively and is maintainable out there in the field. Right? That means you can easily change it, adapt it to how the problem will evolve or your understanding of the problem will evolve with time. Kudos to the Yantra team for organizing such a competition and uh, uh, making us ready for the industry. In stage one, we actually didn't split up any work. Uh, since we all were new to all these things, we decided that we will first learn all the basics and then in stage two, have a more educated decision on how we should divide the work. But even in stage two, actually, since we really loved working individually, we continued that same idea. We had discussions and meetings to discuss like uh, how to solve this particular problem. And once we decided that, okay, this, this is the way we are going to solve it, we tried to implement the solution in our own ways. Then we took the good things from all the solutions and then merged it into one. There might be a certain advantage to toying around with different approaches in the simulator before you actually go out to the real world and program it. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. That's uh, the ideal way to be able to do it. Things like warehouse and pack package sorting does not require precision and therefore it's still possible to get it into the simulated environment. But when you get into precision robotics where you're you know, working on a CNC or a VMC or trying to put it at a particular point, right? So there it's very, very dependent on the actual, uh, you know, distances between all the machines and the robot uh, to the micron level, right? So over there, you can only get up to 90%, 95% kind of an accuracy with the simulation, but the last part of it needs to be done on the site. So to be able to synchronize the robo arm with the conveyor, you need to have some knowledge of what speed the conveyor is running on to be able to take the feedback and then make the robot also move in the same speed such that this drag that you're talking about will not happen. Whenever you do displays, you have a whole bunch of data and you're eager to show the data. But the important thing that you need to focus on is what information are you conveying? Just because yes, you have right. a bunch of data does not mean you have to like, you know, show all of it in its raw form. Finally, what matters is who your audience is and what information you're conveying and what decisions they can take off of that information, right? So designing an information display is different from displaying data. And that's true for each of those components, whether it's a map, whether it's a, whether it's a graph. If you enact, let me be the warehouse manager for the next five minutes and then see what are the things which I am going to see. You will automatically come out with a laundry list of what are the things that are happening and what are the things which are giving you joy and what are the things which are giving you pain points, etc, etc. And then you note them down and then you say, this is my you know, rectangle and in the rectangle, I'm going to put these things and then you start with your end. When you are picking and uh, placing it in the bin, this is where one should use waypoints because there will be a waypoint irrespective of where you have picked up of the conveyor. You can always decide one waypoint that your trajectory should go through. And then from that waypoint to another waypoint in the bin can be a trajectory that you have to optimize because that part will never change. What will change only is the point that you face in, in the bin from the second waypoint. Definitely uh, motion planning algorithms which will give you a straight line path. In addition to keeping the, pack uh, the package without changing the orientation of the package also. You really want to move only the origin of the tool frame it has to move from the pick point to the place point without changing the orientation. All those are possible in good motion planning uh, algorithms. What I saw today, I think it's absolutely unimaginable for so many students to be able to actually not touch the UR, but actually be able to connect with the robot in a virtual environment to be able to study the entire product and to be able to figure out how they can build code on top of this to be able to solve real life problems. By doing it by simulation, you actually propagate the scientific discipline of saying when you design and build something and you test it, the achievement is not that it is working. What you have to test for is that it's working as per the design that you have done. And as you do your modeling and simulation, you will not know 
whether it's actually working as per your design because you don't have anything to compare with. This is actually a process that should be there irrespective of whether you can bring the people in to the actual site and make them use the actual systems. So I find a lot of people who will put things together and they will see a motor running and they will say, great, I've got the motor running. The question I always ask is, is it running at the right speed that you thought it should be running? And how do you know it should be running at the right speed? If you want to uh, build a lot of things, you have to get into the uh, into the discipline of saying, I will do some kind of a logical or mathematical model, simulate it, and then compare the actual data I get with the simulated data to see if there is a problem, you can identify it much faster and you will know how much you can improve it all that. You will have, always have a benchmark. The second part is robotics is so cross and multidisciplinary. And you take the problem skills that all these kids have shown, they have shown that it's across all the domains, irrespective of whether you're a mechanical engineer or somebody writing uh, code or whatever it is. There is a problem to be solved and you know who you're solving it for. So both of those things, the consistent message that came across with a, a dashboard is who are you providing this information for? And through the problem solving process, that's one of the things you set up as one of your goals to, uh, to identify who are you solving problems for. And the last thing message I have is the more time you actually spend on design, and especially in software programming. I have had a lot of experience in software programming. I typically spend so much time on design that the implementation becomes very fast and the debugging becomes very fast because I'm a and I don't really want to spend a lot of time testing and debugging. So, but I found the end result is so much more dif uh, different. Whereas the kids are so hardworking, I find them just start and start coding. <laughs> They'll change it, they'll burn the midnight oil and do all of that stuff. So emphasis on in design is one of the things I uh, tend to talk to the younger generation about, that there are rewards for that, but more on design and you end up getting to your goals much faster. This competition teaches you how to work in a team. Uh, second thing is use of uh, standard open source tools like, for example, Git, right? And the third thing, which I have noticed just now, right, that uh, the competition, as a part of the competition, they are uh, the students are encouraged to do documentation, right? Uh, the this part is like often overlooked as a skill uh, in in your regular uh, VTech, right? And if you consider industry, right, the documentation can actually be very very important. And the third part, which all the judges have mentioned, right, focusing on what can go wrong, right, in the industry, it's more like uh, what can go wrong is uh, put more importance than what can actually go right. Like, how do you define a problem nicely? No, that's a skill. Definition is as valuable or probably even more valuable a skill than actual problem solution. Once it is defined nicely, different people can take a crafted solution. In this uh, uh, exercise, you you were interested in it because robotics is cool, but there's a whole lot of vision is cool, computer vision is cool, robotics is cool, all kinds of cool things you're playing with, you're having a lot of fun. But when you get to the real, get to real life, there are lots of things that are not outwardly cool. But you will find that creating a every every problem, I mean, you just look around you, and you have no shortage of problems. And once somebody has solved it in a beautiful way, is when you realize, oh, that problem was actually not that uncool either. So what I would like you to take from here is confidence in your ability to crack a problem. Once you're interested in it, you have shown to yourself that against very, very tough odds, you were able to were able to take a learning gradient that is very, very steep. You probably at the start of this exercise may not have believed in yourself as much as you believe in yourself now. The nice thing about a very high learning gradient is that no matter where, I mean, if there are two lines that are like, I mean, if there, one is at a shallow gradient, one is at a higher gradient, sooner or later, you will overtake somebody who knows more than you, but because your gradient is higher, is better, you will know more eventually. So it doesn't matter where you are in respect to somebody else in terms of knowledge, but if you have a confidence in yourself to sustain a certain learning gradient, then you can do a hell of a lot of stuff. And this competition sort of should bolster your uh, your confidence in yourself. I've been hearing this thought from you and I've been, it's very thought provoking actually, this whole thing about learning gradient. 
right just because people learn slowly it's of no matter as long as they keep on uh, learning continuously they can go ahead of people who learn in spurts and then don't do anything basically right so i think that's a very important point so that is the story of a theme in the eantra robotics competition eyrc 2020 21 featuring industry 4.0 themes we try to fit the highlights of four intense hours of finals interaction into a 20 minute video to give you a taste of what goes on in learning with the yantra we particularly thank our jury members for sharing with us their valuable insights into the thought processes that make for great engineering it's truly an engineering masterclass so till next year's competition god bless and jai hind